The development of naval weapons is a story of continuous research and experimentation to increase their range. Since the days of John Paul Jones, the Navy's job was to take smooth bore guns with a range of two miles and make them transoceanic weapons. The crude muzzle loader gave way to the high caliber rifle. And during 150 years of improvements in ballistics, the range of naval guns was gradually increased to the relatively short distance of 20 miles. Revolutionary developments supplying jet propulsion to packaged explosives brought a new type of weapon into being during World War II. This novel weapon was used with telling effect by the Navy in its amphibious operations. Development of true guided missiles, however, was just getting underway at the close of World War II. The Navy's job with guided missiles is to exploit their use as naval weapons. Since the summer of 1946, launchings of the subsonic loom, or modified German buzz bomb, have been conducted from a submarine off the California coast at Point Magoo. The shipboard launching of large bombardment rockets of the V-2 type poses problems which have heretofore received little more than speculative interest. The military aspects of such an operation are very real. By launching a V-2 from a naval vessel, its range of 200 miles is increased by the maximum cruising radius of the ship, and it becomes, in fact, a transoceanic missile. For answers to this problem, Operation Sandy was authorized by the Chief of Naval Operations under the technical direction of Rear Admiral Gallery, Assistant Chief of Naval Operations for Guided Missiles. Its purpose was to demonstrate the feasibility of launching a V-2 missile from an aircraft carrier to gain experience in the handling and the firing of such vertically launched rockets. A secondary purpose was the detection and tracking of the missile with standard Navy radar. The operation necessitated innovations in planning and design. The bureaus of ordnance and aeronautics were directed to design and build a supporting device which was to hold the rocket during the preliminary firing stages. New ships was directed to prepare the launching ship for the operation. A CVB type carrier, the USS Midway, was selected for the launching vessel because of its steel deck, its elevator capacity, its firefighting facilities, and because of its steadiness at sea. The Army Ordnance Department furnished technical facilities and assistance in training the Navy crews at White Sands Proving Ground, New Mexico. And later, the Army ordnance experts provided valuable advice in the actual launching of the missile. The launching crew underwent intensive training at the White Sands Proving Grounds, where they prepared and assembled the rockets, readied the necessary mobile equipment for the operation. When preliminary preparations were completed, rockets, spare parts, and necessary gear were loaded and shipped cross-country to Norfolk, Virginia. At the Navy Yard, Norfolk, these were loaded aboard the Midway.
Each of the two types of supporting devices, one furnished by the Bureau of Ordnance and the other by the Bureau of Aeronautics, was tested for suitability to Operation Sandy launching requirements. The Bu Ord device weighed 68 ton as compared to seven and a half ton for the Bu Air device. Because of its low weight and simplicity, the Bureau of Aeronautics device was ultimately selected. It satisfied the launching requirements and presented little chance for malfunction. While still in port, a rigging crew was organized from the Midway's personnel. This crew was trained in handling the missile and in the operation of the Bureau of Aeronautics supporting device. The Army Ordnance Department furnished one dummy rocket for training the handling crews, in addition to the two missiles suitable for actual firing. One of these, a standby. Aboard ship, firefighting parties were trained in preparation for possible mishaps during fueling or launching. The worst eventuality, if the rocket were to topple on deck or fall back on deck after launching for lack of sufficient thrust, result in a flash fire of short duration, followed by isolated burning of pools of alcohol. Here, on captured German film, is a record of what happened to one of their early V-2s during an experimental launching. Notice that the small wooden shack a short distance from the burning missile remains undamaged. Notice also the large quantities of unburned liquid on the ground. The supply of liquid oxygen, one of the rocket's main fuels, required the utmost protection against fire and handling hazards. To minimize such hazards, its loading was postponed until just prior to departure from Norfolk. Alcohol was stored in ship's tanks. It was later diluted with water to the proper specific gravity and transferred to the alcohol trailer. gear aboard, the task group put to sea. It was set up as a unit of the Atlantic Fleet and designated as Task Group 41.16, with Rear Admiral Ballantyne in command. Four destroyers, the Larson, the Goodrich, the Hanson, and the Thomas were also assigned to the task group for tracking purposes as were six PB-1W aircraft to provide air search. Proceeding toward Bermuda, the VIPs came aboard. Admirals Blandy, Sherman, and Duncan, Generals Hughes, Richardson, and Sailor, Dr. Hovde, President of Purdue and Chairman of the Guided Missile Committee of the Research and Development Board. Dr. Porter of General Electric and representatives from Caltech, John Hopkins University, the Ballistics Research Lab and representatives from Grumman, Douglas and Martin Aircraft Corporation. Underway again, the task group headed for the designated launching area located about 250 miles southeast of Bermuda. Daily practices were carried out. Crew training in erecting the missile and rigging access platforms and tracking drills.
While on the hangar deck, the Sandy missile and its standby were carefully checked out. An accurate time sequence was worked out for the actual shoot, and a full dress rehearsal was held the preceding day. September 6, 1947. After months of preparation, the day of launching was at hand. The crew had been at work before dawn, and by 0600, the Sandy rocket was erected on the launching table. Final tests were made on all components. Gyros, steering controls, radar beacons, the Doppler radio transmitter, and the power plant. Carbon vanes were installed and adjusted. The fins had been strengthened to withstand crumpling against a possible five degree roll or a three degree pitch. When the missile checked out satisfactorily, fueling began. First, the alcohol. About 8,000 pounds of ethyl alcohol diluted with water, 25% by weight. During fueling, the deck was frequently hosed down with seawater to minimize fire hazards in case of overflow and to prevent the chance mixing of the highly combustible fuel. Next, about 11,000 pounds of 98% pure liquid oxygen. Transfer of this fuel is normally accomplished by vaporization from a heating coil at the base of the supply tank. In this case, a live steam line from the midway was connected to the coils to accelerate vaporization and maintain a constant head of 50 to 60 pounds. Hydrogen peroxide, when brought to the flight deck, was kept cool by wetting down with water. The 370 pounds of fuel concentrated to 75% by weight were pumped into the rocket. The last fuel to go into the missile was sodium permanganate. About 30 pounds of this chemical at a concentration of 27.5% by weight with water. With the installation of the igniter, the Sandy missile was ready for firing. And now came the crucial moments, moments which might reveal new facts and mark the beginnings of a new use for this fearsome weapon. As X minus one minute approaches, all observers take station on the island.
and the firing control station starts the last minute count. 22 seconds, 21, 20, 19. Ignition. Down supports. Plane looks good. Apparently the jet plane was unstable and the direction of jet thrust was not perfectly aligned with the missile axis at takeoff, causing an initial tilt of almost 45 degrees. After about three seconds, the control vanes corrected this initial tilt. But the missile's flight was erratic and at 12,000 feet, it went out of control, tumbled and broke up. Falling in three main parts, it dropped into the sea about 5,700 yards from the midway. Immediately after firing the rocket, the crew cleared the launching area of all sandy gear in preparation for normal flight operations. In slightly over an hour, the Midway was again a conventional aircraft carrier with planes rising from her flight deck. Operation Sandy marks the essential beginning of a new era in naval weapons, the operational launching of large rockets from naval vessels. It provided invaluable data and experience, which will bear fruit in the future design of large bombardment-type missiles and eventually in the design of guided missile ships. This first launching of a large rocket from a ship at sea is a preview of what will eventually become a routine naval operation. 